Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Edmundo Resendez. On today's Fronteras, we're looking at two exhibits. The first one is a new public art piece in Short North Arts District near downtown Columbus, Ohio. It's called The Messenger Wall, and it was conceived by the husband and wife team of Eric Roche and Jen Kiko. Follow them as they bring this large-scale sculptural mural to life. This is an interesting project because it started last year and now it's coming full circle. So we're on the corner of High Street and Fifth Avenue on the east side in the heart of the Short North or the northern part of the Short North. We're mocking up our uh, public art piece that will be installed this spring. Uh, these white papers will eventually be carved brick, uh, but right now we're just making sure that all of the elements line up and they look good in real life on the wall. The idea behind the messenger wall is to honor people who have been key messengers in our community. And then we also wanted to pay homage to um, a former director of our organization who worked tirelessly to um, do so much good here. And the name for the wall actually comes from him. Um, his name was John Angelo. It also so happens that his last name means angel or messenger in Italian. Um, so his, his name is tied into it, but then the notion of a community messenger is really what they're trying to get across, which is someone who brings, actively brings people into the circle to work together to make whichever community they're part of better and stronger because we're all together in it. So I started thinking of how to, how to convey messages, um, message in a bottle, messenger pigeon. So what Jen came up with was sort of an abstract design that it might look like the way the wind blows or the way uh, a, a bird might fly through the air if they flap their wings. Um, and then this composition carries throughout four panels, and these panels are being installed into old window sills. This project couldn't have been done without uh, the help of my awesome studio assistant, Brooke Slobodian. So we took Jen's drawing and we put it onto paper and then we put that paper onto these wet bricks that we had stacked in the wall pattern and then traced through the paper to get the markings on there and then carved the relief pattern out of there. And now I'm using the back end of a Sharpie marker, marker to trace through the paper and trying to make sure I get enough pressure that I am indenting the wet clay bricks underneath. And then we'll peel off the paper for the, we'll call it medium reveal. Let's just go at it. These bricks are, <laughs> they're about eight pounds each, <laughs> which is, uh, pretty pretty crazy. So that the big panel has uh, 350 bricks or so. I was actually worried um, when we st stacked them as tall as we did that the ones on the bottom, because they're wet, I wasn't sure if they were going to start smushing. <laughs> it didn't, but it didn't. It didn't happen. We have 652 bricks in the panels and then we have 20 six pressed birds.
if the clay is uh, a little bit wetter on the, the side that's touching the uh, plaster, we'll get a smoother surface like that. And where it's a little bit drier, it's a little more crumbly. Um, but dare I say, this is exactly what we were going for. Unload the kiln now. Um, we fired the, the bricks, and he saw the brick clay is that, that green color. It's like a forest green color when it goes in the kiln. And because of the iron in the shale, it turns from green to the red color. So every brick is marked on the back uh, so that we can install them in order. I can't wait to see these up on the wall. <laughs> In taking a look at the neighborhood and seeing where we could help redefine some spaces with um, art and creativity, one of the places that emerged to us was Fifth Avenue because in many ways it's this gateway into the neighborhood. It's not, you know, the, the shiny boutique part. It's, it's the real part where real people walk around and I think that's really cool to be part of their everyday. Public art is, is needed, especially in a place like Fifth and High. Um, so it's, it's nice to be part of the beautification, but it's also important to remember where community comes from and, and who the people are living in that community. It really is part of our mission to help redefine these spaces in big creative ways with art that is lasting. As a high school art teacher, you're so much doing day-to-day -day solving problems on smaller scale. I never thought like I would do something so big and for sure not something so permanent. It's really kind of hard to wrap my mind around uh, graduating from Ohio State and, and putting a, a significant piece of permanent artwork on the corner of Fifth and High, which is the you know, beginning of the arts district in the capital city that I love. A new exhibit at the Brannigan Cultural Center in Las Cruces titled Trotando Pasos Ajenos, Social Justice and Equalities in the Borderlands runs through January 9th. And MSU professors Dulcinea Lara and Nicolas Natavidad are co-creators of the exhibit. And Daniel Aguilera is the designer and builder. They are our guests today on Fronteras of Changing America and they are here to discuss the exhibit. Welcome to Fronteras of Changing America. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's good Thank to be you. here. The big question I always have when it comes to projects of this magnitude is, how was this project born? So um, all of us do a lot of work in the community and we are often called to do guest lectures, keynote presentations, and it all started at a cafe two years ago when we said if only we could put all these ideas together in one room so that people could pass through it and then have discussions. And so that was the beginning conversation where we decided to create a museum exhibit, which um, I think one of us had experience with that, but um, it was new, it was a new project. Well, what's your background? I mean, how did this, something like this, this vision, I mean, over a cup of coffee, it's born, but I mean, to actually see it through from beginning to end, because you just had the opening just recently and to see it actually come to fruition. Yeah, I think, you know, Dulcinea um, approached me two years ago, actually. I had just moved to Las Cruces. I was living in Las Vegas, Nevada before. And uh, she asked if I would be willing to do something, take a risk, and, and use our academic training to think of something outside the box and, and do an art exhibit uh, that would be interactive, that people can actually touch, and, and some type of uh, documentation of kind of the inequalities and social justice issues in the region. So I said, let's do it. My background is, uh, I got my PhD in justice studies, so I focus on social justice issues and crime and law, but for both of us, it's always writing, 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 writing and lecture. So then we decided to put our, our heads together and conceive of the concepts, and then Daniel entered in uh, with actually creating those concepts, bringing them to life. Daniel, how, how, how do you take a vision like this and bring it to life for people to be able to walk through it and really absorb everything that they have envisioned? Yeah, that was, uh, 
in part it was it was easy because they had already all their ideas and concepts already laid out and 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 written out uh, completely, and so it was easy for me to go in there and sort of visualize what what they had, and uh, and revisualize it into something that is uh, tangible, something that is uh, exhibit that would be in an exhibit, and um, and so my experiences are pretty broad. Like I started as a carpenter, I was a union carpenter in, in Los Angeles. Uh, then I started graphic design, then uh, I was a photographer for a little while. And so art has always been in me, and uh, but also sort of more um, just making things has always been something that I've always done all my life as a child. And so I've had vast experiences here in, in Las Cruces uh, doing community organizing uh, in the arts and did it several festivals here um, and exhibited uh, all the way from New York City to, to here to Las Cruces. How has the art scene changed for you? You've been living here since 2002. Mm -hmm. How has the art scene changed in Las Cruces in your eyes? Uh, it's, it's become quite vibrant. Uh, from, from the first, uh, the some art events that we did in 2009 that I was a co-creator of, uh, since then, just recently, uh, there's there's a lot of uh, new um, um, exhibit spaces and, and galleries that have opened up, and people have come up to me and said, you know what, thank you for you know the work that you did back then because it really sort of got people going, and and now what we have now is is a pretty vibrant sort of art scene here, and so um, that 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 feels great to to know that and and to be able to be a part of that. Listen, so this vision you had this idea, this concept we had, how did you decide, I want this in a museum for everybody to come and partake of it rather than it being an exhibit at an art gallery? So I studied a lot of visual culture as a, um, as a graduate student, uh, thinking about the way that we read the world, uh, thinking about billboards and uh, public statues. I looked at the Oñate statue in El Paso, the one in Alcalde, New Mexico, to think about how power works, to think about how um, inequalities work, right? So it's not just this academic conceptualization, but um, one of the, the images that we got from the NMSU archive is of uh, a field near Deming, a carrot field, and it's black and white. It's from the 1950s, we think. And it's an image of uh, Mexican workers in the fields. And I think that the visual component it strikes something emotional in us that wants us to understand power relationships. Um, so I've always been very interested in visual culture and in thinking about the way that we see one another, the way that we see segregated communities. Um, one of the installations is about our perceptions of different communities in Las Cruces, El Paso, Juarez, and the Colonias, where we ask people, tell us where the communities live that eat healthy food, that have high education, um, that are mostly white or mostly brown, right? So we wanted people to interact with magnets, with knobs, with their bodies, with touching the short hoe, the, the asadón cortito. We wanted people to um, envision themselves in a world instead of to uh, sort of think of themselves in a uh, through words. I think words are limited. I also love writing. I'm a writer as well. I'm an academic. Um, I think this was a project done with a lot of love and as an offering to the community. And so the idea of doing something in a museum was to open up this um, institution to people that wouldn't normally go through a museum space, right? Museum spaces are typically uh, thought of as spaces for people with more education or people from a higher um, class bracket, not necessarily for everyone in the community. And so our impetus was to represent the communities that we knew, that we grew up in. I'm from Berino, down the street, a colonia. And we always had in mind our people, right, um, in a broad sense, but also the people that typically wouldn't go to a museum. And so I think it was our way of, um, as Nick said, to use our training um, in a way that would present um, something more broadly tangible by all kinds of people. Nicolas, this is not 
the kind of exhibit where you walk in, you read something on the wall. It's very interactive and people get an opportunity to enter from different rooms, different areas, so they can get a different perception as they enter each room. Yeah, I think you know some of the things that we discussed was um, in our classes we talk a lot about uh, exploitation, um, different things, experiences that people have had specifically to this region that are hard, that are difficult uh, to, to conceive of and, and to um, internalize and then also to heal from. So we wanted to create this space where it is interactive and there's a level of familiarity. Everywhere you look and the way you navigate around uh, the exhibit, there's familiarity with the images, with uh, the different objects that are there, with the maps. Uh, so there's all this familiarity, but at its core, there's discussions in about ex uh, exploitation, right? In and about uh, social justice, inequalities. And we wanted to make it interactive so that it's a fun space. It's a fun space to discuss this. We understand that it occurred here in this region, and it's still occurring. Uh, but we want to make sure that people are reflective of themselves and, and how they perceive this familiarity, but yet can navigate and have fun and get past it for a level of healing that can take place. I think that was one of our, our major goals. Lucinia, talk to me about the different parts of the exhibit. It's not, I mean, it goes beyond borderlands. You have as part of it, um, reproductive history. Yes. Why so was that important? Yeah, we um, were really fortunate to partner with Young Women United. They're a nonprofit um, based in Albuquerque, but also here in Las Cruces. And we were very um, open in thinking about all the different ways that certain bodies um, experience justices and injustices. And one of the things that this collective, this nonprofit does is um, reproductive health issues. So looking at fertility, looking at, um, looking at uh, family structures. And so we were really fortunate to pair with this organization who does um, organizing through art. And there was a, a local artist, um, Brianna Valdez, who made papel picado pieces that represent uh, there's one that is a, um, a pregnancy test and it has a little smiley face and so that can mean relief or that can mean disappointment, right? Um, and so we were grateful to partner with them and thinking about how certain bodies um, are privileged and certain bodies are not and what that means around uh, reproductive health. Daniel, for you, as you put this exhibit into place, were there any pleasant surprises for you? Something new that you got from it? Something that mm -hmm. blew your mind to say, wow, I never thought of that? Yeah, there, um, during the whole process, we, we met for about 11 months. So this process, uh, by the time the exhibit uh, was completed, was uh, 11 months in collaboration. And so all along the way, uh, we met uh, a lot, and we discussed a lot of issues. And I was uh, given uh, the opportunity to also uh, contribute to the content, uh, so not just designing and building. And uh, all along the way, there was things that I learned. There was uh, things that you know I, I knew, but the way they sort of explained it and the way it was presented was was a combination of, of different elements uh, of that that allowed you know a whole different uh, 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 idea to develop from that. Um, I didn't know about the uh, the short hole being outlawed here in New Mexico in 1986 by Cesar Chavez and his team. Um, there was uh, the the border wall was one thing that that uh, of course is constant here, and I grew up in Los Angeles, and so that was something that was always there. But sort of recontextualizing that uh, with um, with faith traditions and how sort of um, that sometimes does does not sort of uh, mesh well uh, the state and uh, and religion as far as the the morality of having a border um, and why the why they want a border. Um, th there was the murals. Uh, the um, there was a, there's murals here in Las Cruces that are that depict the Spanish uh, um, culture here, but there's none that really depict the native culture here. Um, and so those things, you know, it, it's always present. Uh, I, I'm a his I studied history here also, and so those things I, I'm aware of, but putting them together it sort of just gives you a whole different context for what's really going on there culturally. Nicolas, talk to me about the borderlands portion sure. of the exhibit. How, how challenging was it to go through some of the history to bring the borderlands portion to life? So uh, I think that was, um, that was really fun actually when we were conceiving of 
how to bring the borderlands to life. You know, I, I grew up in El Paso. I'm originally from this region. And uh, one thing that, that I always knew, even as an academic, and a lot of people can attest to this, is that uh, their reality on the borderlands is different than, say, someone who grew up in Ohio or New York or all these other different places. And it's very unique to the perspective uh, we have towards uh, land, towards each other, towards immigrants, towards immigration, towards all these different issues. So we want to, to um, respect that understanding of, of reality and on some level display it so, so we can have, uh, like I said, that familiarity piece, but at the same time uh, let people acknowledge that it is real, that, that it's okay to have this different perspective of reality because you witness things differently on the border. So we, one, of the, one of the things that we did was we created a, a border book, which was a timeline of all different uh, historical events that took place on the border. And uh, on it, we wanted to make it a little modernized, so we made it into a Facebook-looking border book. And so you can have, there's little knobs that you turn, giving it the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Everything from the Bracero program to colonization by the Spanish to all the way up to uh, DACA, right? Uh, uh, the DREAM Act. And so all these different things that have taken place on the border that, that then help to create the reality that we understand today are on display so that you can, you can struggle with, well, I don't know how I feel about this event. I don't know how I feel about this. But yet, at the same time, you're reflecting on how those events created the reality inside you right now. And so that was, that was hard and, and we struggled with it, but it was, it was a lot of fun. So. Do you think there's some people that have their minds changed that might come in with a preconceived notion of what they feel the borderlands should be and walk away with a better understanding of what the borderlands really are? Uh, absolutely. I think we, we're a little uh, taken back by the response. I mean, I know both of you can talk about this as well. Um, on, on some level, some people feel so proud that what they've witnessed and experienced is now on display. Um, and I think others have, have commented that they never knew this history as rich and deep as it is, especially when you're talking about uh, border enforcement, border barriers. Those are fairly recent phenomena. I mean, we're talking from the 1980s, 90s, when you really start to see uh, um, strict uh, barrier controls put into place. And so they didn't know that, right? And so the way that borders conceived um, is kind of static, but yet we try to present it as fluid, right? As something that's ever changing and, and uh, ongoing, so. Dustin, in your research, how has the border region changed in our community? How, how is it different from the early 1900s to the you know, the 60s and the 50s and through the 80s. Uh, how, how has the region changed? Gosh, that's a big question. Um, thank you. Uh, in thinking about the border book, it was very interesting to look at um, moments that solidified the border um, and to look at the language. So a lot of the border book includes policy, right? Looking at immigration acts, looking at um, the creation of the border patrol. And so if you look at the final panel um, of the border book, it's the uh, RAISE Act, right? The recent act proposed by President Trump that asks people to take a series of, I think, 12 questions. It's a survey um, that looks to, on a point-based system, see who's fit to be um, a United States citizen. And so looking at that from 2017, going back to 1917, I would say that not much has changed. In fact, the rhetoric is very similar. Um, with regard to the, the physical structure of the border wall, um, a lot of these installations were very timely. We would call each other and say, oh my gosh, did you see the news? That was one of our installations, right? So we have the border wall, we have environmental justice, we have um, the question of Native American voice um, in this in this exhibit, and so um, I would say that it's a constant shifting border. I think that we might see a physical structure here, or may not. It depends on um, who's in power, and it depends on who's in power listening to the people that live along the borderlands. I mean, with that in mind, I mean, if you were to build this exhibit again in five years, how different would it be? My dream is that it would be very different. Um, <laughs> I feel like this is, uh, when Nick talks about this being a fun exhibit, we also tried to make it very beautiful with a hope toward a healing and a hope toward a better world. And so I, I would like to think that a lot of these installations would uh, change drastically because a lot, there's a lot of heaviness to these topics. Nicholas, what's up next for you? I mean, as you 
get this exhibit done. Do you have any projects that you're going to be working on? We do. Actually, uh, Dulcinea and I and, and Daniel's involved at, at two on, on different levels. I think um, the exhibit was the first step in, in a lot of the type of um, consciousness raising that we're trying to do about understanding these social justice issues impacting our region and, and looking at them in a different, different lens. And so one of the projects we have going on is with ethnic studies. Um, Las Cruces Public Schools just recently, uh, um, not that long ago, um, passed a resolution to make ethnic studies a part of their curriculum. And so they're talking about ways to implement this kind of program. And so ethnic studies is, is one way that, and uh, you know, Dulcinea could talk more about this too, because uh, this is exactly her, her background in PhD, is one way to raise that consciousness. It's the, it's the curriculum that, that you know, students are, are hungering for, right? That they, they understand, uh, for example, I teach race, crime, and justice, and I always ask students, have you ever taken a class on race before? And then they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, so you don't know about race relations between blacks and whites and Latinos? And they're like, oh yeah. I was like, so where did you learn it? So things that we understand out on the street in the community with our families are talked about and gathered, you know, knowledge is gathered that way, but yet it's never within the institutions that we have these conversations, which is where we need to have them. And so ethnic studies program, working with Las Cruces Public Schools, and uh, even here at the university is, is part of the next step on that. Nicolás, Dulcinea, Daniel, thank you very much for joining us on Fronteras to Changing America, Trotando Pasos Ajenos, Social Justice and Equalities in the Borderlands, runs through January 9th at the Brannigan Cultural Center in Las Cruces. Thank you for joining us today.